Protein kinases are these enzymes found inside our body which are responsible for catalyzing phosphorylation reactions. And as we discussed previously, phosphorylation is an example of covalent modification. And this is a mechanism that our cells use to basically regulate and control the activity of enzymes and the functionality of proteins. Now we can categorize protein kinases into two groups. On one side, we have a group called dedicated protein kinases, and on the other side, we have a group known as multifunctional protein kinases. Now, what exactly is the difference between these two groups? Well, dedicated protein kinases basically phosphorylate either a single substrate molecule or a set of closely related substrate molecules. On the other hand, multifunctional protein kinases have the capability of actually catalyzing the phosphorylation of many different types of enzymes and many different types of protein molecules. Now, the first question I'd like to address is, what exactly determines the specific nature of protein kinases? What exactly determines the ability of a protein kinase to actually bind and catalyze a specific location on some enzyme, on some substrate molecule? Well, for a catalyzation reaction to actually take place, logically speaking, that substrate molecule has to be able to fit into the active site of that protein kinase. And not only that, the substrate molecule has to have a high enough affinity so that it remains long enough in the active site for that phosphorylation reaction to actually take place in the first place. And so what that means is to have a high affinity between the substrate molecule and the protein kinase, the sequence of amino acids around the site, around the amino acid, which is about to be, uh, which is about to be phosphorylated, has to be correct. Because if the sequence of amino acids on the substrate molecule is not correct, that active site will not be able to bind onto that substrate molecule. So we conclude that the specificity of protein kinases depends on the amino acid sequence that directly surrounds that target residue that is about to be phosphorylated. Now, to actually see what that means, let's discuss a specific example of a, speci a, a specific protein kinase that exists inside our body, and this is protein kinase A, or simply PKA. So, what exactly is the importance, what is the functionality of protein kinase A? When does our body actually use protein kinase A? Well, in dangerous or exciting or stressful situations, recall that it's the sympathetic division of our nervous system that kicks in and initiates the flight or fight response. And what happens is the sympathetic nervous system basically stimulates the adrenal medulla to release a hormone we call epinephrine. And as epinephrine travels through our cardiovascular system, it basically stimulates our cells to transform ATP molecules into another molecule known as cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or simply CAMP. Now, what CAMP does is, it's an allosteric regulator of protein kinase A. And as we'll see in just a moment, it binds onto the inactive version of protein kinase A, and it activates protein kinase A. And protein kinase A, once it's activated, it becomes responsible for activating many different types of enzymes via the process of phosphorylation. And it phosphorylates one of two types types of residues, either the serine residue or the threonine residue. Now, the question is, on any given substrate enzyme molecule, we have many different types of serine and threonine amino acids. So let's suppose we have a sequence of 200 amino acids, 
and let's say 20 of them are actually serine or threonine amino acids. The question is, how does protein kinase A actually know which serine or threonine amino acid to actually bind to? What determines the specificity of that protein kinase A? So it's exactly what we said before. It's the sequence of amino acids that is found around the side, that residue that is about to be phosphorylated that determines the ability of that protein kinase A, PKA, to actually bind onto that substrate molecule. Now, what is the sequence? Well, the sequence known as the consensus sequence is shown on the board. So basically, if the substrate molecule contains arginine, arginine, X, serine 3 or threonine and Y, where X is basically any small amino acid, for instance, glycine, and Y is basically any large hydrophobic amino acid, this is basically where that protein kinase will bind to and it will phosphorylate this target side, the serine or threonine. Now, of course, we can also change the arginine to lysine, and that will also allow the protein kinase to bind onto the sequence. But if these are changed to lysine, the affinity will not be as, uh, will not be as good as in the case where these two are arginine molecule, uh, arginine amino acids. So we see that the consensus sequence that is recognized by protein kinase A is shown to the left. And this means that enzymes, substrate molecules that contain serine or threonine surrounded by this specific sequence will be recognized by the protein kinase A. And the protein kinase A will bind onto this section and will phosphorylate this target site. And by phosphorylating, it can basically change the activity and the functionality of that target substrate molecule. Now, earlier we said that it's the cyclic A and P molecule that actually binds and activates protein kinase A. Now, the first question is, what exactly is the quaternary structure of protein kinase A when it is not bound to the cyclic A and P? What is the inactive quaternary structure of protein kinase A? So this is basically shown on the board. So in its inactive form, PKA consists of two types of subunits. So just like aspartate transcarbamoylase, ATCase, consists of catalytic and regulatory subunits, our PKA also consists of catalytic and regulatory subunits. Now the catalytic uh, subunit contains the active side, while the regulatory subunit contains that allosteric side that binds onto the cyclic AMP. So in the absence of the allosteric effect of the cyclic adenosine monophosphate molecule, the quaternary structure consists of two catalytic sites, and these are shown in green, as well as two regulatory sites, and these are shown in light brown. So this is basically one of these regulatory subunits, and this is the other regulatory subunit. And so we have two catalytic and two regulatory subunits, and so we, uh, we represent the inactive form of PKA with the following format. So R2C2 complex basically means we have two regulatory subunits, one, two, and two catalytic subunits, one and two. So as we mentioned previously, under stressful situations, the adrenal medulla is stimulated and, re and it releases the epinephrine hormone. And the epinephrine hormone basically stimulates the production of cyclic adenosine monophosphate CAMP. And it's the CAMP that is the allosteric regulator of PKA. The question is, how exactly does it regulate the activity and how does it activate this enzyme? So what happens is, if we examine a single one of these regulatory chains, each regulatory chain contains one, two allosteric sites. So we have one, two, and two here, so we have one, two, three, four, of these regulatory sites that the cyclic adenosine monophosphate can actually bind to. 
Now, once that CMP binds onto all of these regulatory sites, so we have four CMP molecules binding to four of these sites, what happens is that creates a conformational change that allows the R2 complex, so this entire brown section, to actually dissociate from these two green sections. And so what happens is these active sites, which are occupied in the inactive form, basically become unoccupied. They become free. And once the active sites are free, these catalytic subunits, and we have two of them, can basically go on and catalyze all these different types of target enzymes via the process of phosphorylation. So once again, cyclic adenosine monophosphate binds to allosteric sites found on the regulatory chains. This stimulates the dissociation of the regulatory subunits from the catalytic subunits. And once the catalytic subunits basically dissociate, those active sites become free, and now the substrate molecules can go on and bind onto those active sites. And by the way, this is the active site here, and this is the active site here for this second green subunit. And in this inactive form, both of these, uh, both of these active sites are basically at, uh, occupied by regions of the regulatory subunit units and the sequence of amino acids found on the regulatory subunit that binds onto the active site is known as the pseudosubstrate sequence. So in this R2C2 complex, it's the pseudosubstrate sequence of the R subunits that binds onto the active site and occupies that active site. And because that active site is occupied, it cannot bind to substrate molecules, and so it is not active. But if our concentration of cyclic AMP inside our body begins to increase, what happens is those CMP molecules will begin to bind onto these allosteric sites. And once bound to all four allosteric sites, that creates conformational changes that causes these pseudosubstrate sequences to dissociate from the active sites and that produces this R2 complex. So notice that these two regulatory R subunits do not actually dissociate, they remain bound together. But these two green catalytic subunits basically dissociate and so now they're activated because these active sites are free, they can go on and bind to all different, all sorts of different types of substrate enzyme molecules. And once the substrate molecule binds onto the active site of that catalytic subunit, what happens is this catalytic subunit, which actually consists of these two lobes, so we have lobe number one, lobe number two, once that active side becomes bound onto the substrate molecule, those two lobes essentially close off, and as they close off, they basically create a perfect conformation between the substrate molecule and this catalytic subunit, and that allows the phosphorylation reaction to actually take place.